So uh, after, thank you. After my uh, uh, very quick welcome message, uh, my director, the executive director of uh, GNA, Mr. DJ Kumar, will come for introductory introduction remark uh, and share a bit our position on climate change. Uh, everything we are doing now, he will share with you in five minutes. Then we'll go to our experts. So the first one is. Uh, Madam Vosita, uh, who will talk about adaptation as a tool of to fight vulnerability of climate change. And uh, then Mr. Sena Luca, uh, I will present them later. I will share their bio with you. And believe me, they have a very interesting bio. Uh, Mr. Luca will talk about uh, concrete action, adaptation actions uh, in the field. So he will share with us his experience. And please uh, put your Comment your question in the chat and the chat box. Somebody's there. Somebody will treat them, and we'll come back. Uh, we'll come back for debate during the Q and A um, um, period. Uh, by saying this, allow me to invite Mr. BJ BJ Kumar uh, for your introduction uh, message. Over to you, BJ. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, and thanks, Adeso. It's great seeing more than 100 uh, co-travelers connecting in this webinar. Uh, and we need to uh, discuss, debate, and see how things can be done better way so that we can transform the world that we live in. I remember 50 years back, I was in primary school. So there was a competition on environment. That was in 1972, the Stockholm Environment Convention. Uh, so that is where uh, we had a competition in the school. I was writing about environment and I had to cook up stories that if the water is not there, what will happen? If the sea level rises, what happens? I was just imagining things through this. And today, after 50, almost 49 years, I don't think we have, we have to imagine anything. We are seeing the impact of climate change in each and every part of our lives and livelihoods. But it is not it's not adequate representation of what we're experiencing. If we, if we, I live in London, we are impacted. Uh, many of us we live in various parts of the world. But if we go to the small island nations, if we if talk to the people who are living in poverty and exclusions and are on the front line, if we talk to the women who whose uh, whose male members in the family who have left for working in urban areas, leaving them because of the drought, leaving them back in the villages in Kenya or Ethiopia or Tanzania. Uh, and if we ask them, the experience is so different. So the climate change has a complete disproportionate impact on the people. And this impacts uh, uh, the poorer, the most vulnerable, the, the women, children, person with disability and elderly, they are most impacted. Now, if you have to change this, then we have to talk to them. We have to ensure that we, exp we, we enable them to analyze the risk that they're experiencing, prioritize those risks, and try to integrate those risks into the local level planning processes. That is the only way that we can confront the impact of uh, the climate change that is happening today. Now, in that context, uh, I'll come back to this. In that context, we let me put forward our strategy, global strategy, that we said local leadership for global impact. We have prioritized the role of, the collaborative role of the civil society organizations in convening, facilitating that process to how can we promote the localization where the community most at risk analyze the perspectives, bring it to the local level planning processes, and how can we bring risk in front development in all aspects of our life. Now, coming back to in the climate change, now, for example, the climate change is primarily talking of adaptation and mitigation. Can we still talk of adaptation where the, uh, the people can adapt to the adverse impact of the climate change? And, uh, and we together uh, have our efforts to uh, mitigate the impact of the greenhouse emission uh, increase so that we can reduce it to the level of 1.5 degree uh, and we actually retain that 1.5 degrees Celsius increase of temperature from the pre-industrial pre, pre level. But is that 
people don't have the land. If you go to Pacific, the water level has increased. They have lost the land. If you go to uh, Africa, the sub-Saharan Africa, their livelihood has changed. So it is not, they have nothing to adapt to. It's still, there's a total loss for them. That is a loss. So the, the thing is that they have to change their livelihood. They have to change the way they live. They have changed to the locations where they're living. So it is adaptation plus plus. So that is what we are actually putting forward as loss and damage framework, where we are saying the communities who have lost it, they might be needing that support, additional support from their state, their government, which are happened to be the developing countries, least developed countries, and the small island nations. So that is where we are saying that how can the industrialized and developed countries put the resources together for those things that have created the devastating impact on those people who have not been responsible for what they're experiencing today. It is not because of them that climate has changed. It is because of the industrial industrial nations that climate has changed. So we need to actually see how we can act on that. And now uh, we are getting into COP26. Now there are lots of discussion since that environment summit that I talked about. Lots of discussion, lots of debate. But now the time has come to act and act and only act. And that we can do together. So this is the time that we need to actually understand and come together to see how we can join hands together to, uh, to ensure that life of the people living most at risk are transformed and their livelihoods are reassured and their dignity is restored. Looking forward to working with all of you more closely. Thanks a lot. Back to you, Adesso. Thank you so much, BJ. Uh, as I said, BJ is the executive director of JNDA, uh, so he has uh, a long track, you know, he called in humanitarian, and you can feel it from his speech. He has also strong advocates of shifting power from the international system to the community-led capacities. And this is exactly what he has tried to do through his speech. Thanks again, uh, BJ. I've heard and I've taken from your speech a very short sentence, which is the time has come to act. So for us to act, we need to know how to act. And this is why we are exactly here. So uh, let me invite uh, Madam Bosita. But before uh, I invite Madam Bosita, let me inform you that uh, she works as the executive director of Silicon Trust a non-profit think tank working on climate change, sustainable development, and biodiversity, uh, also on ecosystem conservation and social justice. She's an international lawyer specializing in public international law and has over a decade of experience in working on climate change at national, regional, international level. Her recent work focus on climate policy and action related to national adaptation plans and indices means nationally determined contribution, localizing climate action, climate in this migration and displacement and action related to loss and damage induced by climate change. She's based in Asia, but she has experience working in Asia, Africa and Europe. Welcome, uh, Vosita, and uh, please, the floor is yours for the next 10 coming minutes uh, to share with you, with uh, the, the participants, your experience on climate change. Over to you, Vosita. Thank you very much, Adesu, for the invitation to be part of the discussion today. Merci beaucoup. Uh, so good morning, good evening, a uh, bit of French, yes. Uh, so thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today. And um, I will be speaking on adaptation as a tool for vulnerability um, to be addressed. Um, so I will quickly try to share my screen. Give me a minute. Um, hope you can see it. Right. Um, so I would focus on keeping things simple so that uh, we speak about how we can share good practices and also have participatory and inclusive climate resilience actions. Um, so when you're talking about adaptation, as uh, BJ mentioned, uh, we also have another component, which is mitigation, which focuses on emission reduction. And at some point in time, when people realize that 
just reducing emissions is not enough because we're already feeling impacts of climate change. Uh, we shifted to adapting to these impacts that we are feeling. So that means finding solutions on how we could survive when uh, with the with the climate change that's happening. And then also then we're talking about loss and damage where we cannot adapt anymore because there are limits of adaptation. Um, so all this comes with a discussion of how can we build resilience to face these impacts? Uh, and, and how can this be a process which is collective, which means it's inclusive, which includes uh, everyone in society and that um, everyone who is vulnerable, who, who are at the forefront, and how can we scale up the actions that are already there? Because we're not trying to find solutions today itself. There are solutions that have been practiced. There are good practices that we have um, faced uh, or used or practiced, uh, which can be scaled up if we have more support. So this comes in the conversation of accessing finance as well. Um, and then how can we address vulnerabilities? Because we face climate impacts, but our resilience capacity depends on our social context, our economic context, or where we are placed geographically. Um, so how can we understand the vulnerability of a community of individuals or a sector in a country or a region? So here we have to understand the climate risk that's being, um, being faced by the communities or the ecosystems and the biodiversity. So it's important that we um, have evidence-based actions that are planned, risk assessments that are done, the technology that's needed for us to adapt. Um, and then we also have to understand how climate risk impacts us and how risk management can happen. So for example, if you're talking about the agriculture community um, or even fisheries um, or else um, another sector that's very dependent on natural resources, the vulnerability of that community that's dependent on this sector would be much higher than a community that is not dependent on these natural resources for their livelihoods. Um, or for example, if I have an education that would allow me to have a different livelihood, once my existing livelihood is impacted, then my adaptive capacity, that means the capacity for me to adapt to a situation that climate change would um, present me with is higher than what it is for someone who doesn't have this aspect. Similarly, if we have um, paddy or else maize as a um, first crop that we are practicing, and then these crops are impacted by a flood or a drought, depending on the climatic zones. Then how do we adapt to this? It could be economic diversification. It could be someone having a secondary income. Um, it could be shifting the sectoral activity that we do to something completely different. So risk management has different facets of it, which could be socioeconomic, which could be accessing finance and technology, it could be building awareness, creation um, of new opportunities for communities. Um, and then we can look at how these opportunities could be inclusive, participatory, and also community-driven actions. So um, I don't want to get into too much of uh, policy discussions, but this plays an important role as well, because if you're taking action on adaptation, we need evidence-based actions. We need finance, resources, technology to implement these actions. And we also need inclusive and part based processes, which are national, local, as well as international. So in, in this inclusive participatory actions, play a key role, the voices of those who are impacted play a key role. Um, so how do you bring the farmers, the youth, the women, um, or anyone else who's vulnerable with different needs uh, into the discussions? Um, how can we bring their voices? How can the processes be participatory? How can the formulated actions be inclusive and with inputs from the communities that are impacted? Um, and also how can the national and international processes be brought down to the local level where the decisions could be adapted to suit the needs of the communities as well as the ecosystems um, and the needs um, due to climate risk that they're facing. So it's important that we have civil society play a key role. It's important that we have awareness and outreach that happens it's important that the good practices are shared as well as those things that didn't go right shared so that we do not have policies and actions that build on uh, maladaptation or practices that are not properly recorded, um, as well as monitoring and evaluation uh, of short-term actions as well as long-term impacts of resilience building. Um, so education capacity building, knowledge management, um, and then also having access to information would be important um, because sometimes people in the community who are impacted by climate change would not have access to this knowledge. 
So um, enhancing education, family education in schools, universities, uh, and also through livelihood programs is important. Uh, capacity building to adapt, uh, what kind of measures need to be taken. Uh, if we need to change the crops, we have to inform the farmers about it or get informed by them to make decisions on how to change the patterns of adaptation practices and knowledge management, which is accessible. So through the society could have knowledge portals, you could have multi-stakeholder driven knowledge portals, you could have local language based knowledge sharing, uh, which is accessible. Uh, and which is understood by the communities because most of the time knowledge could exist in a language that they do not understand when we're looking at local level action. Um, so long-term resilience is the ultimate goal, uh, making people be um, able to address the impacts that they're facing at socioeconomic aspects as well, um, and also making sure that they're part of the solution. Um, so I hope I didn't take too much time. I'll be here to answer your questions. If you have any, um, um, if you'd like to get in touch with me, that's how you can do it. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fosita, for your presentation. Quite uh, quick, quite simple and uh, very efficient. Thanks so much. Uh, and I believe that uh, people will have a sufficient comment or question uh, that they will send to you um, after the presentation of the the next panelist, who is Mr. Sena Aluka. And before I invite Mr. Sena Aluka, let, 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 let me say that uh, uh, BJ has started his speech uh, by talking about his childhood, his, uh, when he was young, I may say, he talked about studies. And uh, Vosita ended her presentation by saying, we need to build capacity, we need to uh, make sure that people have information in the right language, people need to be educated. So we can see the importance of education in the in this system. But now uh, Sena will take us to the uh, field in terms of um, a reality check, what's happening in the field. But before Sena intervene, let me tell you that Sena is the executive director of uh, NGO, Jeune Volontaire pour l'Environnement, means uh, Young Volunteer for Environment, a youth NGO working on climate change, adaptation, sustainable development, biodiversity, conservation, and environmental entrepreneurship. Sena has fought to extend GVE across the world with a physical presence in more than 20 countries. He is a development specialist with an impressive background. Sena is a resource person for the government of Togo and has invaluable competency in youth capacity building. Sena has tremendously contributed to building several leaders working around the world in several sectors. His main region of expertise is Africa. Uh, Mr. Aluka, uh, as I say, you are very, very broad. And please, in 10 minutes, if you can summarize all this knowledge you have. But, but before you start, please unmute your, your mic and uh, join the floor. You are welcome, Sena. Thank you very much, Mr. Desu. I'm so happy to be here. And um, uh, it gives me great pleasure to see the global network of disaster reduction moving to an area where we want it to be, basically the capacity building. I hope BJ can remember when we talk about the Gendia University Institute Academy. I'm so happy. I think I'm the happiest man in this whole room to see that the Gendia is really listening to its members and taking to consider some of our key uh, advice and recommendations. Uh, mine is just to uh, not, not, not to uh, go deep, but uh, to explain uh, by sharing how, how some of the things we do, we're doing. Uh, uh, mostly um, uh, uh, some of the, the, the road that I can put you guys on. So let me just share my, um, hope it works, yeah, it must. Here you go. So what are some of the concrete uh, adaptations, uh, actions that can be taken at grass level? Knowing uh, that uh, my dear Rosita and we will be for the past 10 years now, uh, she has already presented uh, the thing, the, the board. Uh, so my name is Sena, some things that need to be done. Um, Sena, excuse kind of me. About introduction and uh, adaptation and the different between integrations and what resilience is all about. And some of the things that people are doing 
Yes. Uh, your 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 internet am is I, am not too fast. No, 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 no. You have that's that's your speech. We know that we are very used to that. But if you can cut your picture, maybe we can hear you better. Oh, really? Internet is not very stable. <laughs> okay, let me do that. Let me just do yeah. that. That's a good yeah. idea. Um, let I think uh, he has left, but uh, just uh, bear with me, Sena will come back. Um, yeah, very quickly. He's already here. Welcome back, Sena. You are muted. No, you are muted. Unmute yourself. Yeah, okay, fine. Go ahead, please. We can't hear you. We can't hear you. Yeah, yeah go ahead. So, yeah. So, uh, as you know, this. this can you hear me now? Yeah. This is where we're in today. Uh, with all the disasters you know about, um, uh, in terms of health, in terms of diseases, zoonotic diseases, uh, flooding, uh, water stress, etc. That you know about. Uh, either it's burning, why is being noted. So we are living in this. Uh, way today and uh, as you see the picture in the middle of this coastal erosion in my in Togo uh, coastal erosion is swallowing swallowing literally uh, so that's a serious situation our roads our centuries our houses uh, so now I was talking about uh the some uh, effects of climate change in the field. So he was commenting on the on the pictures uh, that uh, um, have been um, um, showing the impact of uh, flood. Uh, he's back, so he will continue. Uh, so now you are talking about uh, the coastal erosion. Over to you. Unmute yourself, Sena, and uh, come in. Uh I hope this is not about. Uh, I, we need to adapt. I'm very sorry for you guys. Uh, talk about local solutions. So uh, I'm trying to mute from different internet internet providers as my way to adapt to this new situation of internet instability. Um, yes. Yeah, so uh, climate change is just exacerbating uh, existing problems that we know about, poverty, etc. Um, and one that I've been working particularly on over the past 20 years is that of uh, 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 youth unemployment. So, you know, Africa has the largest population of young, young people. And the rate of unemployment is so serious. And this goes along with uh, difficulty for people, for young people and children to enjoy their uh, basic human rights. And uh, as we can see, some uh, have already decided to take the sea. And when, when you, you are ready, you are facing this kind of situation whereby you have to have one degree employed by 2050, and you have climate change adding to that, you need to start thinking about what should I do? So the question, what should I do is where adaptation comes in. So what are we talking about here? Very simply, we're talking about uh, adapting How do we adjust to the new, new, new system? Uh, so in terms of to the new, uh, uh, new situation in the way of reducing okay, uh, the, the impact, or if possible, to take advantage. Whereby mitigation is all about all
So it's all about how do we uh, how how do we uh, mitigate? Is how do we reduce uh, um, the carbon emissions um, uh, globally, locally, and local, uh, and also at the national level? So uh, countries are being advised to draft their national adaptation plans that we call NAPs. Then when it comes to mitigations, some countries have been asked to reduce the mitigation, the, the carbon emissions. To a certain amount. So those countries are those who are being, you know, uh, signing so-called uh, scenario. This one I'm going to. Uh, so now, uh, are you there? We are. We are really struggling to hear you, and I, I can imagine the challenge with the interpretation. Um, yeah, but. Uh, I think we are summarizing a bit. Uh, unfortunate, it's unfortunate for the, the beginners, uh, but welcome back and please try to continue. Okay, let, let, let me just go quickly and then reach the, the most important part of this discussion. So what, what are we talking about resilience? That's very important for global network for disaster resilience. Resilience is our capacity, our ability, our skill to continue to live in the future, project yourself, live a good life, uh, uh, irrespective of whatever happens next. So it's in the context of climate change, it means how do you develop despite, you know, in spite of natural disasters, seasonal irregularities, or all other shocks that you can go through. So your resilience is your capacity to still continue to live and prosper, no matter what happens. That's what it's all about. And so what people are doing at various levels, people are doing, trying several activities, and this can apply in terms of, uh, it can apply to uh, uh, energy, agriculture, it can apply to planning, it can apply to health, it can apply to education, uh, all other sector, all sectors are interested here. Let's take, for instance, the case of energy. What can you do to uh, adapt yourself? What committees doing? Committees are, for instance, promoting uh, clean cooking technologies. So it's very simple, but it helps you not to rely on the global market of like fuel or like petrol or kerosene. So you are living a simple uh, community life. So it helps you to adapt by reducing your uh, uh, reliance on uh, fossil fuels, for instance. Uh, one other way is uh, how government, government can, you know, like uh, uh, take new um, action by, for instance, drafting their new uh, adaptation plans, for instance. Uh, as you can see the picture at the right, some are going in terms of uh, uh, training young people. So education, environmental education, is one of the best ways of uh, fostering climate adaptation at local level. Uh, when it comes back to agriculture, there are various ways you can, you can do. So some communities, for instance, are promoting agroecology. Agroecology is the very best way, the best drive to foster climate adaptation at local level. We don't have time to go deep into that, but you just go and look for agroecology is 11 principles and, for instance, uh, preserving community seed bank, for instance, uh, supporting women and, and, and agriculture or small business at local level, uh, et cetera, can help to foster, to promote adaptation at local level. Uh, all that set up, what you call, uh, when it comes, for instance, in terms of uh, um, uh, flag, for instance. So communities here and there are setting up what you call community uh, disaster early warning system. So how can you quickly adjust or react to you face uh, uh, flooding, et cetera. So that's a way also of adapting. Some are migrating, as you can see in the picture. Migration is a way of adapting. So you can move from the village to the next city, uh, or you can move from the city back to the village, because you see there are more opportunities here and there. But uh, in Africa, let me tell you, one of the best adaptation practices is solidarity, Africa and India. How, how do you deal with a uh, situation of elderly, those vulnerable women in the villages, at, at some point in time, there's nothing government can do 
Only family ties are very important. That's why I'm taking advantage of this uh, opportunity to encourage all of us to build strong families, strong communities, strong solidarity mechanisms among ourselves. Women groups, youth groups, etc. Cooperatives are best way to foster family adaptation at local level. So finally, to say that uh, we are all in front of climate change today. Last uh, no, last mm -hmm. Tuesday, the UN released a new report saying that by 2030, all the three glaciers of Africa, Mount Kenya, Ruenzori, Kilimanjaro, will have no more ice. They will be gone by 2030. We are talking about 90 years. So we are in the face of the situation. We need to adapt to it by doing what? Like I said, education is point number one. Train yourself, read the law, go to the news, go to the committee for points, uh, read the current national adaptation plans, the, your country NDC, the national the, uh, systemic contribution document. Second, uh, uh, adopt new practices like agroecology, uh, new uh, cooking stoves, and most importantly, please build strong family ties, uh, build strong cooperatives in your communities as a good way of adapting to the climate change. Namaste. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry for the in and out of, uh, of the incident. But I hope at the end we have all adjusted. Thank you so much, Senna. We are talking about adaptation. And believe me, we managed to adapt to the situation uh, that the internet has created. Uh, it's very rich. Uh, I know we've not caught everything because of the internet, but I can assure you that uh, we follow you with uh, the best attention and we've uh, I'm sure uh, at least 70% of your message uh, passed through. And I can again repeat, if you want, we need to build strong family. We need to build strong uh, communities. And that's uh, the sense of localization that we have been advertising for um, uh, a while ago. So now, again, thank you all for your presentation. And now we, we will jump directly to the uh, Q&A. And... Um, as I said, uh, we have uh, some question already here. Uh, let me read uh, the five first questions and uh, whoever feel concerned will uh, take the floor very quickly and share uh, he, his or her thoughts uh, with the participants. So the first question is every, um, for everyone, this is the question, uh, for the moment trying to adapt is the solution, but how, how uh, about, what about mitigation? That's how I can summarize the question. What about mitigation? Uh, so please, I know we are not talking about uh, mitigation today, but mitigation appears as a solution uh, to fight against climate change. So please, uh, uh, whoever has a very brief idea uh, to share, uh, you will take it. The second question, how can we help the vulnerable people, especially women, poor, women, poor people working in food, from risk of climate change. Uh, I'm not sure you, I'm not sure I get the whole sense, but I'm sure you will get it better than me because we are expert of the question. Uh, let, let, me, let me put it like that and uh, come with your answer in case you have any idea. Uh, aside from Pakistan, uh, we the mountain community in Hindu Kush, uh, Karakoram and uh, Himalaya, region are under serious threats of glaciers melting due to global warming and many, odd, many other factors at no fault of ours. What is the international community doing to mitigate the impact of climate change in this region? So please, if you can fly, if you can go far and try to see what is happening at the international level to share with us. Posita, this is especially for you. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, uh, I have a comment. So the comment is training should be encouraging the community to empower uh, them and build their capacity in climate change issue, avoiding all kind of risk that may arise. So that's a comment. And thanks for the comment uh, for whoever uh, put it. Uh, what are example of good practice for resilience? Um, I, I think this question is for Sena. Sena, so please, again, uh, you will repeat what you've already said but maybe in another word, uh, by sharing some of good practice for resilience. And I'm sure Musita also, uh, with her field experience, can, uh, can uh, enrich the participants. So let me stop it there. 
And uh, please, uh, whoever wants to start, let me say, uh, Sena, because I'm sure your internet is much better now. If you can have the floor and try to, to answer directly to some of the questions that are uh, uh, yours, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's important to, to mention here that uh, when you're talking about adaptations, uh, of course, we, we all tend to go and say, let's go help people to adapt. Adaptation is not something you decide to do. You, 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 you are going to adapt in a way. Humanity ecosystem has been adaptation. And no adaptation is also a way of adapting. Some people decide, let me confront, let me do nothing and wait for fatality to happen. So uh, in, in some way, everybody is going to adapt. Uh, uh, only that at some point when, when you die, there's no way you can get adapted. That's why it's good to you take proactive action. And communities, in fact, an ecosystem don't much need us. You know, let, let, let's be honest. Communities and ecosystems have been adapting for years, for, for, for ages. So now us is maybe try to look at what are the best things happen here and there and share with them. So in terms of supporting vulnerable communities, uh, to adapt to climate change, like I said, uh, one the best, the first best way is to understand what are the challenges at local level. It's hard to take something that's working in Pakistan and apply it in Sudan. So, what are the local level? What are the uh, underlying causes? Like I said, climate change is just exacerbating existing challenges. So there are some culturally deeply rooted causes of injustice that are there. And that we need to address, that has nothing to do with climate change. That's why it's good to understand what are the local uh, realities. So after understanding what you can do with the rural communities is, well, share experience, share knowledge. They have knowledge, they have their way of adapting already. Maybe just to bring into their community what we call modern knowledge. For instance, how to plant uh, um, uh, uh, their, their varieties, if there are some fast growing varieties that are uh, locally indigenous at some point, yes, we can promote that. Uh, when to plant exactly their crop because they don't have access to meteorological services, that's a way we can help. And one good way, like I said, is cooperative, helping them to be in groups, very important. But again, uh, uh, one thing we need to know is that adaptation happens at various levels. Uh, it happens at policy level. So how can the community or the, the, the county or the region or the country adopts a policy mission. There are some technological uh, uh, mechanisms as well. And then there are some uh, way of you know, sharing risk also. And as, uh, as you know, here there is a specialist in that. How do we share risk with, uh, with, with, uh, with people? So it's important that we don't copy and paste, but also that we don't think that without us, community will survive. They will survive. They will even try, try without you. So as it just to facilitate, and uh, uh, for me, the, the key word is empowering. It's about helping them be happy, giving them knowledge, uh, capacity, and skills, and let them be. So uh, that's the, the thing for, for vulnerable uh, communities. Um, I don't know if there's another question that is very directed to me. Um, yeah, when it comes to education, uh, like I said, uh, like Gandhi said, there's no ever biggest power, you know, to change things, to improve things in the world, so down to education. So I think it's uh, highly important that we, 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 we uh, educate our people. There is, uh, in the climate negotiations, a whole component called, called ACE, Action for Climate Empowerment. Um, that was the antithesis of the, of the first uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol. Yes, we need to make sure that education is key, that young people, that uh, uh, children, everybody participate. And uh, uh, that's why I am sending this call to all of us. Please, let's look at our country nationally determined contribution, the document our country are sending to the UNFCCC. Is, it, is there a component about empowering young people? Is there a chapter on education in schools, at, uh, even at grassroots level? Is there a component about empowering students is there a plan to have a, a key educational program at universities for our young people in India, Pakistan, Togo, and Ghana to be able to understand and, 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 you know, and support uh, our government? Yes, uh, we need to support this uh, education aspect. Uh, let, let me stop there, Mr. Kosini. Thank you so much, Sena. I, I just uh, summarized. I would say uh, uh, you, you, you show how important the 
indigenous knowledge are and how important it's to bring the activities to the field. Thank you so much. Uh, Vosita, I'm sure your you have a lot of burning issues to share and meet yourself and come and share your experience with us. We will come again. Okay, thank you. I mean, it's great to see Sena after a long time. We connected when I was working with youth. So um, it's great to see him as well. Um, so going to the questions, um, I'll start with the question of why we are not talking about mitigation here. Um, one, because you decide to have this on adaptation, but it's not that it's not important. Uh, it's, it's because if you're talking about vulnerable communities, um, they're not the one who are the reason to take um, uh, climate inducing actions most of the time. Uh, so when you're looking at mitigation, uh, we look at the developed countries to take commitments, whereas the developing countries would like to keep their right to development at some level, as well as uh, be able to adapt because they are the ones facing most of the time the vulnerabilities. Um, so that could be one reason why we are not highlighting mitigation here at the moment. It doesn't mean that it's not important. Uh, we can take individual actions to mitigate, uh, but as a country, a developing country, a least developed country, uh, I think adaptation and loss and damage would be key issues to focus on as well. Um, so looking at the next question, I'm going to quickly go through. Uh, how can we help vulnerable people? Um, so looking at that, that's actually a very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, recently, we did for the Food System Summit some work um, which was focusing on youth in the country where we went across all provinces and collected data on what they found as the key things. Um, and Action Track 5 under the food systems is about climate resilience. Um, so it, it, was, um, it was important to see that sometimes, though they are experiencing climate impacts, they do not link it to climate change. And... Um, the decisions that they're taking could be uh, based on the economic um, economic um, situation plus the access to information or the knowledge that's there. So um, how can we help them, as Sena highlighted, education, awareness creation, um, providing them opportunities to build their dreams, for example. Um, um, and I'll link this to economic empowerment as well as economic diversification. So for example, if you are impacted by uh, climate change in the food systems, uh, looking at how the risk transfer or risk management could happen, um, looking at options that are, for example, insurance schemes could be something looked at, inclusive and participatory ones, where communities could take risks supported by risk transfer options. Um, and looking at the international communities doing um, actions on um, impacts of climate change in the Hindu Kush region. I think ISI mode works a lot on this uh, from what I've seen in the international discussions. Um, and then also um, uh, at, at the national level, as well as South Asian regional level, there are discussions around how collective actions for resilience could be taken. Um, and then good practices for resilience and how communities could be enhanced to um, engage in participatory mapping. Uh, so recently we did some work um, on guidelines and also taking national determined contributions, which are national commitments to the local level. Uh, there we focused on agriculture, forestry, biodiversity as the main areas and also eco, um, for example, economic actions and gender responsive actions. So here we had uh, engaged the con um, communities in consultations to identify the key needs and also linking um, how local level plans could take into consideration the climate risk uh, would be something that um, can be considered as well, working with multiple stakeholders in doing this action. Uh, if anyone would like to get more information on this, do write to me. Uh, and one example, and I'll stop um, unless um, Adesu has more questions. Um, so uh, in one of our projects on, I'm actually going to go merging the question on nature-based solutions. Uh, so some of the work on adaptation and conservation plus residence building uh, of communities uh, was on mangrove conservation, which we practiced recently. Um, and here, the communities that were dependent on mangroves or fisheries um, um, were encouraged to engage in the conservation efforts as a secondary income generation. So waste management, pollution control, um, how waste management could again then take an action on mitigation um, because we are recycling the product that's collected. So that was one example. Uh, that's one example I can share with you um, where communities as well as fishing community were engaged in it. Uh, and looking at the agriculture sector, um, Sri Lanka is a paddy-based um, um, country mainly as the main crop. Um, so identifying um, different crops that could be introduced. 
as a secondary crop um, is one option that was like presented, for example, ginger or peanuts that was introduced for organic practices. Um, and then also, there's also the secondary one, which is actually sad because people would be leaving a livelihood like agriculture because they want to look for another one. So trying to keep them in agriculture through providing them support or entrepreneurship options, uh, looking at the whole food cycle would be another option to do this as well. Um, I'll stop there at this. Thank you so much, uh, Gosita. Um, I, I can understand from your speech and the intervention of Senna that adaptation is not new. So people are used to adapt. And Senna, there was a comment in the in the Q&A saying, what do you mean by adapt or adjust? Is there any difference? Is there, uh, I know it, it's, it's a matter of semantics. So I don't know if you have uh, any thought, but there's also a question for Jendia, which is about the data collection. What do you do? Because for uh, somebody, I'm sure from research sector, uh, access to data is uh, key for better adaptation. And uh, uh, currently uh, access is not easy. So what is GND doing? I don't know if BJ is online. If not, uh, the representatives of BJ will manage to, to join, to, to try to provide the answer to that question. Uh, but there is a very good question that I would like to hear uh, Vosita on very briefly, and Sena will come later. Uh, how do you uh, ensure that you empower women capacity, women and vulnerable people capacity to adapt to climate change? Are you doing something? Uh, on that aspect in the field? If so, please share your experience in one minute. Yeah, sure. Um, so we do have training programs. We have um, priority and gaps and needs analysis that we do. So we've been doing this with groups in Africa as well as in Asia and also at local level. Um, so identifying communication patterns for them, which would be understood um, in local language is one. Understanding their key needs and like having context-based and contextualized capacity building processes is one thing. Uh, and also having groups set up for them to have their own initiatives to empower themselves and uh, livelihoods. Uh, it's important that they feel confident enough to take action than depend on another party to build their capacity because there's a lot of capacity in them that needs to be uh, taken out and um, implemented into action. Uh, and once they believe in themselves and identify these are the options that we have, uh, there's a lot of innovation and solutions that come out of it. And just going back to data, I, I was actually typing the answer here. Um, so we work on climate and disaster based transfer and data has been one of the key things um, that, um, that has been a need. And many countries do not have accountable or transparent data available for all indicators that we would need for risk mapping or risk assessments. So it's very important that countries are supported, uh, especially for accountability, transparency, as well as monitoring aspects, um, and also for risk assessments to be done uh, so that evidence-based adaptation actions could be taken on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, very interesting. Sena, can you unmute yourself and uh, again, jump in if possible? Unmute yourself, please, and jump in if possible, Sena. Uh, I think the technical problem still continues with Sena over there, but uh, uh, is oh, BJ online? Okay, Sena, okay, you welcome. Maybe, maybe before, okay, you can go. So Sena, go ahead, go ahead, Sena. Okay, no, basically sharing uh, something we, we do. Uh, I don't know if I can just show this. So uh, it's response. So it's not very, it might not be very clear, but as you can see, we organize, uh, it's called Festival Agro Bioculture. So it's ABC. So Agro, Agri, Agroecology, Biodiversity and Culture Festival. We've been organizing it for the past 17 years. It's bringing young people from all over the world, from mostly Africa, coming to learn what about our traditions, our roots. So very important, uh, like we said earlier, to build resilience and adaptation techniques within traditional ecological knowledge. People in our villages, they have the knowledge, they are the experts. It's important we bring young people to go to talk to them. Uh, I will share. Yeah, so I wanted to respond to that issue about resilience again and that mitigation. So just to say that there are some activities that are on both sides, both on adaptation and mitigation. If you plant a tree, it will help you to resist or to reduce the shock of the wind. But at the same time, trees help to store carbon. So tree planting is a way for, of both adapting and um, 
the mitigation climate change. I just want to point you to get this very interesting book. This book has helped me a lot over the past years. It's free, it's available, it's done by IED, uh, you know, uh, the boss of IED, and uh, there in Pakistan. Uh, please uh, download this book, it will give you all the simple, basic, community-based adapting techniques at local level. That's what I want to say. Thank you, Adil. Thank you so much, Sena. Uh, let, let me respond to the question uh, uh, concerning uh, uh, GNDA. So, what do we do to facilitate the access uh, to data? Um, yeah, we we acknowledge the difficulties to access information, to access data, especially with the med service. Not because they don't want to share it, but you know, with the uh, uh, realignment, restructuring of uh, the World Bank, uh, it said that the med service will sell data, and this is the the, the major difficulty. But uh, actually, AGN there is, um, has started implementing a project on local leadership uh, for global impacts. And myself, I'm leading the climate uh, uh, aspect of the project where it's planned that we will work to localize the data, which means we are finding, uh, we are looking for, we are seeking for the, the, the easiest strategy to make sure that we make the data available at the local level, the exact data. So uh, we will work with the med service and ensure that the information that will be collected by the members, by the community's members will be available and can be treated by the community members themselves to plan. For, so for example, the farmer will know exactly when he can plant uh, trees in his, uh, in, in his farm. Uh, the the uh, fishermen can know exactly when they can go uh, for fishing because exactly without those information, sometimes they are confronted to very and exposed as well to uh, economic and uh, uh, dangers in on the sea. For example, we've we've seen in uh, Mauritania and Senegal a lot of people who have lost their life. Uh, during fishing activities simply because they were they didn't know that there will be a storm and they were exposed to that storm that has unfortunately led to, to death. So we, we hope we can really do this and we need you all, we, you the experts of data, you the, the, the research department you can join us uh, to really facilitate and advocate for easy access uh, to, to data at all levels. Uh, we are four minutes um, uh, before the end of the, the meeting. Maybe uh, we'll close it here. Uh, I'm sorry we cannot respond to all the questions, but continue to ask your question because we can respond by writing. I want, I, I want also to inform you that by tomorrow, you will receive a link, an assessment link for you to share with us what you like and what you do not like, what we, you think we should improve uh, to make this activity much more uh, benefit, uh, benefiting for the for the, the participant essentially. Also, uh, we have uh, uh, recorded the, the webinar, so it will be available on the YouTube of GNDA. You just type YouTube GNDA and you'll find it. It will be available soon there. Uh, for those who are not yet a member of GNDA and who want to join, uh, just take www.gndr.org slash member slash join us. Once you tape that, you'll find us. Uh, to become a member, it's very easy. You just select your profile yourself and you will fill the form. And after some days, you will become a member of gender in case you meet all the criteria. Um, by this, allow me to thank you all. Thank everybody for your availability, 127%. Since the beginning, it's really amazing. We know you have got a lot of Zoom meeting and sometimes people are tired. But let me thank also the, <laughs> the participant. I can see Sena coming back. Maybe he has to say something. Uh, Sena, please, you have the floor. No, no, just, no, just reacting to one of the comments. And the guy is totally right. Please, we are no more in the era of climate change. We are in the era of climate emergency, climate crisis. Let's stop talking about climate change. We are in the era of climate crisis. Uh, the window of ash is getting slow, uh, smaller and smaller. So every step counts. Let's all take action now. Thank you.
Thank you so much. So now we are in the era of climate crisis. We are in the era of loss and damage. We are in the era of disaster. But we can fight disaster simply because we act together and we need to do something. We, need, we don't need to go only to the meeting. We also need to act in the field. And this is why we are talking about actions in the field. Thank you so much, Sena, for your time and for your commitment. Uh, Vosita, I can't take you more. Uh, for my dear interpreters, I know how challenging the session was, especially with Sena, but that's adaptation. Thank you for your availability. I want to thank also my colleagues, uh, Daniela, Julia, for your support. Uh, it was a great process, and uh, I will be happy to join you back again. And I know, Vosita, I see you in less than uh, 11 days now, so I don't know yet. But thanks for your time. Thanks for your availability. Take care of yourself. The world is very, very sensitive. Take care and have a nice day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.